looking smug as hell as we eat New York style cheesecake. It's Feed Your Please, a hateful voyage through the Delta Quadrant. My name is Joseph. And I'm your medicinal sex toy, Peter. Before we launch into our discussion of this week's episode, Peter, we've got a couple things we like to do periodically around here. Number one is that lovely theme music that you heard prior to us starting to talk is the construction of our good friends and fans, Ian and Sarah, who not only made that, but also our, shall we say, uh, guilty pleasure favorite uh, version of doing the inner light theme <laughs> that we occasionally break out. In fact, we'll be breaking it out when we uh, post our Battlestar Galactica. And I know they were for drunk patrons. for Voyager. Were they drunk for inner light too? That's a good question. We'll have to clarify on the V'ger Please Trauma Support Group, our fan page on on Facebook that we very much enjoy having people join and uh, participate in. And we get a lot of folks who are very eager to sharing the spiciest memes uh, as, as appropriate for all of us uh, mid thirties adults who want to talk about Star Trek Voyager. <laughs> and we, uh, we would encourage you as well to join the V'ger Please Trauma Support Group because the only way to get through this is with friends. And then lastly, there's nothing quite like inflicting pain on others. So if you want to do that, you should definitely review V'ger Please. Specifically, if you can, do so on iTunes. But any platform where you're listening to the show, leave a review and engage with it, share it, give it to someone you hate so they will lose 180 hours of their time. That's a lot of fucking track talk, man. It is, but man, we've had some people who have taken up the show recently, and they've joined the trauma support group, and they've had a lot to say about going through it. It takes me back, you know, when someone talks about like episode eighty six, it's like in season four, and and it's it you, you bring you it brings you back to a, a simpler time when there wasn't co <laughs> when there wasn't COVID, and there were a lot more Nazis, you know, in, in Voyager. <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I was, uh, listening to Delta Flyers and they just reviewed macroism, which I got, man, Robbie McNeil, his opinion on some of this stuff is, is really starting to hurt. I, oh, they shit all over fair trade. Fuck off guys. Fuck off. What? Delta Flyers. I, dude, what? I know. But anyways, they did ma- macroism and it's interesting. Hold on. We were, we were, we had solid wood for fair trade. It's like probably among our favorite episodes. No joke, it was, and me hearing them say that like the the stories didn't make sense. Like, I... it was one of the few episodes of Voyager where the story made perfect sense, <laughs> where you actually related to what was going on. I know, I know. Hey, listen, it that this is why we're on the hateful journey. Is Voyager can bring a lot of hate into the world, but anyway, so they're hitting macroism. They were right at the tail end, kind of of uh, of the 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 lockdown right and them reflecting it on the back end and it's funny because when we did macroism like we were right on the front end of that stuff right right so it's it's interesting to see that transcend uh there's a lot of uh us out there and uh yeah inflicted on other people it's a good time appreciate it it is a good time especially when they get like 30 episodes deep and they look at you with those eyes and say what have you fucking done to me i mean everyone lives for that feeling oh speaking of feelings to live for though Oh, Peter, nice. what episode did we watch this week? Season seven, episode seven, Body and Soul. I I, I think I talked this one up. Said fucking hilarious, great. I deeply enjoyed rewatching it. What'd you think, man? I recognize that this is a good episode. Uh, I did not enjoy a big chunk of this episode because it's the type of Trek humor that uh, does not resonate well with me. And if you jump back to was it Inside Man, maybe? Yeah. Inside Man was uh, was like a sillier episode, and I thought all that comedy hit right. So in this, it's a good premise. It's just some of, the, some of the, the hamminess falls on deaf ears when it comes to me. And here I thought an episode whose B-plot was Tom Paris embracing what he was born for would truly hit you right where you live that th- this episode's just like a like a puzzle right a rubik's cube and there's like i like the blue dots and i like the green dots but then the red dots shift in and i'm like eh, maybe this is a trash oh wait and then it just reconfigured itself again so 
yeah, again, I mean, the, the B plot's strong. And even, like, there's a really cool premise. And I'm going to go ahead and c- contradict myself. Because a lot of times I'll say, like, here's a thing that Voyager put out there. And Voyager doubted its own writer's room enough to the point that it said, we're not going to flesh this out. We're just going to say, hey, uh, the hologram war, right? Right. And let other people fill it in. And that's going to be cool because if we tell them what the hologram war is exactly it's gonna suck and and we're gonna shit the bet on it and in this case i'm like dude i want to know about the fucking hologram war. <laughs> i i think the idea of a group of people warring with their own artificial intelligence creations that they had enslaved as servants is quite interesting given you know we we did an hour and 45 minute show on Battlestar Galactica like two weeks ago. Yeah. There's and a I mean, parallel there. We all know Terminator, right? We all know about the, the robot uprising, but like, man, when the fucking evil robots are holograms, the, the carnage, when I mean, you could just brain sucks. slap people. Yeah, like slappers could, only one shot kills, man. When you could see 1000 your hand into like, fucking reaper scythes and like cut people what a bloody fucking when you could go like full-on psyops and like be the face of any person you just murdered and like torture their spouse with like you know mind games and all this other like changeling shit like yeah man it's like terminator plus the fucking dominion war there's a rich vein to be mined here and uh, unfortunately we do not spend any time mining that instead we have my favorite Jerry Ryan performance, which is Jerry Ryan attempting to be Robert Picardo for an hour. <laughs> I think it works great. I love it. And uh, let's get into it. Let's talk about this thing. So before we start, uh, I would like to go to the uh, arid wasteland desert that is Memory Alpha for season seven. Deeply useless. Voyager. Deeply useless Memory Alpha. I... I'm so curious, like, why the drop off? Is it just everybody starts a project and they're all excited on the front end and just collating all this data? Or has the Star Trek fan base remained rabid and furious in in cataloging stuff? But at this point, they're so deep in that, like, star log and whoever just doesn't give a fuck anymore. And they're not doing these promo fluff pieces and grabbing those primary sources back in 2000, whatever to be referenced in the memory alpha. I think think it's mostly the latter. When you look at the content that's available in terms of background for the other Trek shows that preceded this one, it's because they have these incredibly intense fan followings. Like TNG was obviously just universally adored. There's tons of stuff out there for them to transcribe into an internet Wikipedia And DS9 has a cult following, which is almost better for this sort of thing. And Ron Moore loves to talk, right? Like Ron Moore loves to talk. So there's tons of things that he's said that you can use as background. Like, hey, that really awesome fan theory that totally makes sense about who Starbucks dad is, is definitely not the thing. Yeah, thanks, buddy. And I appreciate you shooting yourself in the dick like that. And I can't come up with anything better than what I just condemned. So we're just no comment. So Voyager's appreciation, I think, has come much more recently in terms of the fans of the show starting to assert themselves. For sure. And thus, there isn't as much of this going on because really only the past two years has people like looked back at Voyager fondly, you know, and you get calls for, oh, let's have Janeway in things. And, oh, let's talk about doing like Voyager related spinoffs or connections where there is no call for that until yeah just the last 10 minutes and, but 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 to like the star log and what was the other big uh, publication that i mean there was always a star trek official fan club magazine or whatever but you know there were a lot of articles and and sci-fi periodical coverage on that stuff especially in the early stuff because they were actively promoting it. and i'm sure someone it was, was being also paid. when that stuff was job dropping off i remember the st- the star trek magazine was almost all pictures by now like it was just set photos and fluff because 
the in-house publisher people were cutting the stuff because the internet was coming around. True facts, man. That like speaking to that specifically, what's what's our uh, episode date on this? It's November fifteenth. Yeah, I mean we're almost two thousand and one on this. Yeah, I mean printed media is dying quickly at this point, and uh, why? Yeah, why put the time in on on? It's amazing how quickly it died too. I mean, literally when the show started, I was still reading that magazine. By this time, it was not even a distant thought in my head. Show's still on. Like, just in the seven years it was on, that's kind of when it happened. I wonder when they saw the viewership numbers, if they were kind of like, man, should we just cut this thing short? This is still the best show on this network by by rating standards by a long shot. Really? Oh yeah, UPN struggled through its whole life, and this was definitely their best show. Second best show was was the fucking WWE was was SmackDown. Do they kill Enterprise early? They do. They canceled that show. Uh, that's when they were starting to cash it in on the UPN as a thing entirely. It's mm. part of the reason why they canceled it. Was like this sh- network is not going to continue going to merge with the wb into being the cw speaking of side note real quick did you see that shit with uh paramount plus and the trek movies that i posted i did so the news was that paramount plus basically decided to paramount decided to license the trek movies to amc instead instead of having them on their own fucking streaming service streaming is a is a nightmare now like it really has come full circle from Streaming is the end of piracy because there's no reason to do it anymore because it's just easier to buy your $15 subscription in Netflix uh, than, than pirate things to let's go pirate things again, because now everyone's got a streaming service and keeping track of who has the rights to things and and then paying the fee to be on that platform is absolutely not worth it. Now I legitimately don't know where I can watch a fucking movie. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know where I know I can find it. I can find it on the pirate bay or wherever, you know, like. Uh, Anyway, so Memory Alpha, the one good thing I was able to get out of that is that there were large swaths of this episode. And this is uh, Robert Duncan McNeil's last uh, directorial piece in Voyager, right? Correct. So you got Robbie directing this thing, and there are large chunks of the seven of nine scenes that were recorded by Robert Picardo as the doctor to give her like a visual uh, cheat sheet, right? Correct. Which she obviously used to great effect. So all of her performance spot on, like I, it, you cannot watch it and not see the doctor. Right. And it oh, was yeah. really cool to see that this isn't just her interpretation. Like these are verbatim doctor the, movements. She has just all of the physical, the, that's sort of smug uh, way that he holds himself. Those Italian hands. Yeah, she absolutely nails mimicking that in exactly the way you would expect the Doctor to be in Seven's body. It was definitely an actor's craft here. Like, the, the idea of Picardo recording the scenes, her watching them, and her being like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Like, great job on all their parts. We start off we got a little Delta flyer action going on and this away team is composed of Harry Kim at the helm. And then you got the doctor by way of his mobile emitter and seven of nine and the doctor's doing some science, but the inertial dampeners are not good enough. And his science is getting all fucked up by limp wristed Harry at the con. I do like the idea that seven of nine's personality is becoming more and more evident. Like you see that in, when she is herself in this episode, particularly at the beginning and the end where they're both really tired of the doctor's shit, <laughs> you know, and they bond over that. Like, Oh, fuck this guy. Oh, three more days of being stuck in here with this guy. Holy shit. Like you'd expect Harry and Tom to be having that conversation. But we're like Harry and seven to be having that conversation. And seven's just got this smirk on her face of like, Oh yeah. I'm ready to just disable this guy's vocal processor. Fuck it. And I'm by most accounts, his best friend. Yes. <laughs> hey, listen, I don't know about you, but my best friends annoy me sometimes too. I buy it. Sometimes I want to rip their throats out. That's okay. <laughs> I enjoy these moments where they juxtapose characters 
and you have the pure AI, even though he's totally just a regular flesh and blood dude based on everything you've ever seen Voyager portray in the past four seasons, minus that one time someone flipped his uh, ethics switch off and then he became... <laughs> Thanks, Equinox. Dim- Thanks for two- crushing his character beneath your boot heel. <laughs> two- two-dimensional Dr. Evil. Uh, but he's a man of the... He's an... He is a program of the arts. He enjoys opera. He enjoys photography. He gets very poetic uh, at the observation of some space dust that has traces of, uh, you know, what could eventually, if it falls into some primordial soup and maybe gets a little nudge from Q, could spring into a full-blown species. And he sees beauty in that. And he's showing all of this to Seven of Nine, who couldn't possibly give two shits. The doctor has an an artistic soul. I think it's fair to say. It is how he manifests himself. And he is doing so. And Seven of Nine is like, you invited me back here to wax philosophically. Are you fucking serious? (laughs) Like, we're scientists. We've got jobs to do. We're scientists now. Your hobbyist into uh, the beauty of life is starkly contrasted by my previous occupation as... um, a world ender yes as a murder bot as a, a tide a, of a sexy murder bot a tide of destruction to which nothing survives and has been given license to continue terrorizing the quadrant courtesy of a Catherine janeway but their little discussion gets cut short as the ship starts getting rocked and some dudes in some olympic athlete warm-up outfits Yes, but from, like, a broke Eastern European country, not, like, a rich Western country. Yeah, like, it's not, like, the nice worn-up suits that your Canadian athletes might be wearing. These are the fucking Belarusians, you know? Like, these are the the Belarusians in the 80s as portrayed in a... Inspirational underdog movie. Sports sports saga or Will Ferrell movie. Throw Vince Vaughn in there, too. Right. Actually, the main guy kind of looks a little Vince Vaughn now that I'm oh, looking you know, at him. Speaking of Vince Vaughn, you know what they do look like? You know, they actually look like they look like the outfits that the the purple cobras wear in dodgeball. Uh, ben Stiller's <laughs> like group, like laser blazer, like those guys, like that's it. They're the fucking dodgeball guys. The dodgeball, the Dodgers, the dodgeball guys, the purple cobras. Yeah, purple cobras. They pop on the ship and they're like, hey, listen, uh, we're attacking you. Uh, well, this is before they actually transport over. They say, listen, we know that you have a photonic insurgent, which might mark the first time that w- will come to become one of the most popular words in the U.S. vocabulary yeah. uh, gets mentioned. <laughs> it's about seven months before it's time here. <laughs> God. There's something to think about. It is pre-9-11. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Does does 9-11 touch Voyager at all, do you think? No, I don't believe so. I believe this show completely wraps before that comes. I know that uh, it definitely colors some of Enterprise. For sure. Uh, what, a, what a mind fuck to think of that people watching this stuff are right up on the cusp of such a world changing event and just completely oblivious to it and, and it's what's also wild is that world changing event was 20 years ago 20 years ago a month from now you're getting too heavy joe we got to get back in all right that. back to dick jokes let's <laughs> find a dick joke to make anyway the purple cobras show up They're they say like, listen you got a photonic insurgent everybody at home's like what the fuck's an insurgent <laughs> um and not only are they attacking the Delta Flyer, which does not just peace out with its superior. This is this is the same Delta Flyer, Joe, that uh, almost won the the death race, like a solar system over. This right? This is the same Delta Flyer that could go toe to toe against the Borg on multiple occasions. I just okay. Everybody at home didn't get to see that because you and I are looking at each other through a web camera. But this is clear. This is obviously an audio based podcast. I watched the Hope die. That's how I'm going to describe your expression. Not I've watched... this, this is me phrasing like, do you, you want to reconsider how good of an episode this really is? Like, this is real, <laughs> well, no. real silly shit in play right here. I'm going to go ahead and blame the fact that a uh, thirsty fool, uh, Carrie Kim's at the con and had this been Tom Paris 
they would have either a escaped or b just turned and murdered the belarusians yeah no they would have they would have murdered the belarusians because that's what he did to those uh Kmart Kmart. Klingons i don't have that were, were after him when he was in like just a type two shuttle remember he's like trying to escape and trying to be a good starfleet officer he just gets pissed off throws the brakes on pulls a maverick and kills them like ah, i'm just killing people now mm-hmm. fuck it gonna omit that one from the log hey <laughs> uh directive what, what we say it was directive starfleet directive two doesn't matter the ends justify the means right yeah to starfleet general order number two my insubordination doesn't matter if the right thing happens in the end <laughs> <laughs> uh so they're hitting it harry kim's sitting there you know they're getting free shots on him and they start hitting him with uh, uh a funny phaser and that specifically starts destabilizing the doctor and uh, he freaks out it's like he's going to be decompiled which is basically deaf and says seven do something you know and see what happens uh the belarusians show up they are like hey you've got a fucking photonic aboard you you terrorists we're on to your shit and he's like what what do you mean our doctor like (laughs) what the fuck is wrong with you people and they go to the back, and Seven of Nine is the only one back there, and is like, "You, uh, you killed him." Not at all suspicious. <laughs> like, for, that's if there is a a perhaps a leap of logic that this episode requires you to take, it's that at no time do the Belarusians realize that Seven of Nine is acting weird. I know they've never met her, but even if they haven't, it's like you seem like you're hiding something, right? Like she's got it written all over her face. Cause as the doctor notes, I am not a spy. I am not good at lying. I'm good at murder. I'm good at being Colonel Campbell. That's different than being a spy. Mm-hmm. I am not a spy. <laughs> so in, the entire time, you're just like waiting for one of the Belarusians to be like, I'm going to get my claws out. Let's start cutting up these arguments you're making here. All right. Let's jump back to live fast and prosper. The doctor's a great fucking liar. The doctor's a great spy. Remember that fucking con he ran on the uh, the con artists? Oh, that's right. He was he impersonated their captain. Do you remember how he fucking straight up lied to Seska, the queen of Burns, and she bought his shit? Okay. Oh wow, yeah, you're crushing. You're crushing this argument. Like, go ahead, keep going. Make this make doctor me bleed. is is he he's acting the fool, and it's on purpose. He is trying to. I don't I don't know what his end goal is here, but he certainly has the chops to pull this off instead of looking guilty AF as soon as these fucking <laughs> Belarusian jabrones show up. He's what just so he's delighted to be in Seven of Nine's body. He just doesn't know how to hide it. You know, he's he's like, yeah, this like... is why I gave her double D's. I've been waiting for this. <laughs> <laughs> you think that was all natural, Annika Hansen? No, that is some 24th century science. Mm-hmm. Implants and not just cybernetic. So they go, listen, uh, you were aiding a photonic, and we're going to start looking at your little science set here, and here's some fucking space trash you've got in a test tube. We're going to make some wild accusations that the insurgent was uh, building WMDs or dirty bombs or something. That's it. You're all under unrest. We're going to impound your vessel, and we're going to do, I don't know, something with you. Um I want to go ahead and pause right here again. This, and they even like call attention to this plot hole, this inconsistent, this silliness in the episode. And I'm going to jump back to uh, Random Thoughts, which was the ridiculous Kenneth Bewilder episode where you had a group of telepaths that were so fucking um, brittle that if anybody came onto the planet's surface with a naughty thought, it would plunge their entire society into chaos. So, Yes, and, then, and and didn't tell that to their visitors from another part of the galaxy, who then brought down their angriest person, who only, who like the Joker only has negative thoughts, you know, like oh yeah, and then it ends with a grinder hookup involving Event Horizon, yeah. It's amazing too to to think back on that episode and how what a weak point Belana Torres kind of was in that first second season era. Yeah, and like how strong she can be now, and I think I might have to. Uh, she might be my favorite character for Voyager. She is definitely not my favorite character. She's grown on me a lot, but I would still definitely rank the Doctor Seven of Nine 
and Cass all above her. Cass, I can't count at this point. I mean, she's been gone for so long. Conceptually, I will say conceptually, when they let her be what she could be, she's definitely one of the best. She is the under most underappreciated character on the show. Certainly, yes. Um, but but same deal here. Hey, we're in a fucking what I'm assuming to be a brutal, ugly, ugly, ugly war with these shape shifting AI Terminators, and you're, you're not gonna have like a like a warning sign next to a fucking construction cone at the edge of space saying, hey, <laughs> like, no photonics allowed PLC. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely a strict rule. They bring them to their prison. They're in the space pokey. Now the prison break episode we did it. Jailbreaker. Yep. Yeah, we did That's, it. That's uh, this two in a row. I wouldn't say inside man was a prison break. I think there was another one last few episodes. Critical care critical care that's right doctor also in prison again yeah uh, <laughs> he's been in his yeah tom tom's tom's retired from prison duty uh and that is where the thing that is obvious to the audience is then explained to the idiot that he <laughs> that is ensign kim when seven of nine is like yes uh don't worry doctor's alive because i'm the doctor seven of nine downloaded me into her cybernetics so uh i uh didn't expect to be in control of her body, but I am, and it's awesome. <laughs> it's fantastic. It is the best thing ever, and all of the comedy from this episode is just Jerry Ryan playing the delight the Doctor has at being in her body is great. It starts here and goes through the entire fucking episode. You got two dishes in front of you, and you're you're the Star Trek writer, and one dish is like... <sighs> established canon and in, in our understanding of science and the world and then the other plate is uh jerry ryan getting to act like the doctor right right and you you tell me that in the course of 15 seconds when they start getting attacked and they're like oh fuck you gotta hide me they somehow come up with a way to make the emh's program compatible with whatever the fuck her implants are and then the emh which has grown so wildly in complexity and size and scope that the huge wall mounted air conditioner in sick bay that is his like his house right that's where his uh, his main computer is mm-hmm. i buy that it can fit in like 20 29th century is that what that 20 mobile? yeah the the mobile emitter is from the 29th century yeah i i get it i believe you can put all of the data the Federation has on that book. Okay, I, I can go to Micro Center right now and buy a 256 gig micro SD card that's smaller than my pinky nail, right? Mm-hmm. So I get that in the future, stuff grows fast, but you're telling me that she put the whole fucking doctor in her like that. Yep. So yeah, they went for that second plate that's <laughs> like... They, it's like that it's that elmo cocaine thing right just like <laughs> right to the plate with this damn jerry ryan be the doctor like damn. and then like another writer came in and said oh is it lunch and then they looked at the first plate that was like hey we've done multiple episodes that the doctor's program is so wild and big we had to like cannibalize other things to like the first writer took that plate and like poured all that shit in a potted plant and then threw the plate out the window so nobody could ever even see that right and it was like Oh, cool. Doctor humor. All right, let's do that. Uh, But uh, I do think it's cool that like when she's uploading, when she's transferring his data, she's using her assimilation tubules like I buy that. Mm -hmm. Absent the very uh, correct thing that you're pointing out, which is they don't ever try to explain how it is that her cybernetics are able to hold that much data when they've made such a point of how impossible that should be. I buy the idea that like she's got you know Borg bits, Borg bits hold sure. data. She, her, her tubes work to transfer it. Sure, all that makes sense. Not only does she have all of the collective information the Borg have, right? Because mm-hmm. she pulled out the fried chicken people's little fucking the microwaves that they ran their whole technology on. Remember? Yeah. Yet she doesn't know about her own assimilation or her dad's location. <laughs> those details out <laughs> but even with all of the fucking borg knowledge she has in this database she still has room for the fucking doctor like this mrs western digital over here i 
if she does not have like backups for all the important stuff on the show, the next time there's an episode like, oh gosh, we lost some critical piece of information and that system's gone, I'll be like, you're telling me Seven didn't back that shit up? I don't buy it. Uh, seven of nine, the sexiest solid state drive you'll ever see. Seagate of nine. And I'm calling her Western, dude. I, I hate Seagate. I've lost so much personal information and experienced so much anguish because of Seagate. If we ever get popular, and we start doing like ads, right? which is never going to happen anyways. I'm right. telling you right now, Seagate's permanently on the fucking veto list. Good, good, good to know. West Will not Gulf, Uber Alice. We go back to Voyager. On Voyager, we have the most delightful B plot of all time from a meta V'ger please perspective. We've all been opinion. waiting for it. This is something that we have discussed ad nauseum. <laughs> between the two of us over the course of 170 odd episodes what's that peter it's the holodex being used as a brothel and tom paris is the pimp and that is entirely what this b plot ends up being about what is the problem we got some uh vulcans with the rape feelings once again regretting his ugly head as we mentioned when we did the the episode when vorik uh, inflicted his pawn far on Balana, and we we posited that this is kind of horrific, and the Vulcans are these incredibly logical and and stoic individuals until every seven years when they have uncontrollable you know rape feelings and will just sexually assault people in order to uh, alleviate themselves of that feeling. Uh, we have finally Tuvok going through pawn far, which of course he has to over the course of the show because it's seven years long, and. We also find out that apparently the older you get as a Vulcan, the more powerful the pop The harder your becomes. dick gets. Yes, the dick just grows an extra inch. It's just, it's even harder to control yourself. So this is a problem, right? Like, Tuvok's an older Vulcan. He's the security chief, and he is horny. And the doctor's gone. Tom's like, uh, what the fuck is going on? Because he's the only medical practitioner on the ship. And... You know, the, the Tuvok eventually has to confess what's happening, to which Tom's like, oh, this is this is funny. It's kind of funny that I have to help you. But uh, they had pre-planned for this, which is the doctor made a medication for him to be able to take. And because Tuvok is a Vulcan of unique focus, he feels that with that medication, he should be able to to tamp down his wood and uh, and restore order to his brain. This does not work. <laughs> the medication ends up not being enough. The doctor's not there to assist in making new stuff. Tom's like, I'm not a doctor, so I might just accidentally kill you if I try and reformulate the doctor's work. Unfortunately, but we don't have any juggalo technology where we could just encapsulate you in stasis until the doctor is back. But what I can do, what I am an expert at, Commander, is making sex dolls. I have literally spent most of my time on this ship across seven seasons making fuck toys for different members of the crew. Yeah, let's think of Tom's bo Tom's body count, so to speak, when it comes to people he's gotten laid. Anybody who went to his French whorehouse in seasons one and two. Anybody that went to Neelix's simulation. Because while Neelix created the, the resort... All of the all of the people in it had to come from somewhere. So you know Tom was behind that. Anyone who got laid at via Fairhaven, including the captain. Mm -hmm. And then anyone the movie who, theater. Yeah, and as as noted, uh had the, the situation where people use the Captain Proton mm. simulation to like rescue damsels in distress who are very grateful. This dude has gotten a lot of people holographically laid, and he is offering his services to Commander Tuvok. I love that all these B scene um, meetings between Tuvok and uh, and Paris, most of which would take place in the very sensually lit Club Tuvok. Yes, they're all very dark and very back alley feeling. You had a very harsh portrayal of Pon Far. You called it a, a rape energy, I believe. Yes, that that's not us being being shitty, right? Like that's, no, that's that's how it was portrayed. That is blood fever, okay? And blood fever represents 
the first time since really TOS. And I'd have to say if it's between Blood Fever and what we saw out of uh, out of the, out of Spock, like Vork is much more like psycho rapist. So it's not a pretty scene. And <laughs> maybe Vork was kind of the wake up call for Voyager. Like, hey, we need to start addressing this stuff now. Like. There's at least three Vulcans that I think we have seen. There's the there's Vork, there's Tuvok, and then there's the uh, the Maquis one, which I'm still trying to wrap my head around. And I'm guessing when her time comes, it's it's not really a real problem or whatever. I'm guessing she's a lot more likable than fucking bitch ass Vork. <laughs> Some, it just happens off screen. Some dude took her up on it, you know. Like, <laughs> so she's like, "I'm going through my pond forest." Like, all right, I'm in. <laughs> like, woo, both hands. <laughs> cool. There's like a deli. Like, take it, take your turn. Um. So okay, Tuvok had plenty of forewarning on this, uh, and I like that he's got basically cold shower the medication ready to go on that. Um. I'm guessing it's not something that can really track down the exact range of which it's going to pop up. It's It's got like a pretty large window, and that's why the doctor's going off on uh, away team missions right when Tuvok's starting to come down with, what do they call it, the uh, Trillian Tuka- flu? Tuchelian flu. Yeah. I think uh, Robbie kind of gave himself some juicy opportunities with Paris in this one. Being the director mm-hmm. and the... Uh, I don't want to say sinister, but the more sleazy aspects of this B plot, he framed him fun. I like it. Yeah, I mean, it's very Tom. It's very appropriate. He's like, listen, I'm going to be practical about this. You need to fuck. And that means the holodeck because the holodeck is for fucking. This is canon confirmation. The Federation. This isn't just DS9 with quirks like dirty fuck dens. No, no. The Federation also believes that the holodeck is for fucking quickly says like, this is the thing. And it's not Tuvok doesn't say, Ooh, holograms. He says, I'm married. Right. Like very specific objection, which is it's infidelity, not disgusting. And then we have my favorite line potentially of the entire series. Right. And I thought it was going to be what we needed to name this episode. And that is the holodeck doesn't count. When he fucking said that, I was like, man, because this this really we've talked so much about a holodeck infidelity, what the Federation's views on on fucking holograms is, um, you know, uh, Tuvok brings up like, uh, is that what you tell your wife? wife. And then there's Correct. a discussion about like Tom saying, uh, you know, my days of rescuing princesses are over indicating that Balana probably would not be okay with him banging photon poon F- from an expanded universe perspective this b plot is so fucking important for like yeah starting to they to go there a little bit which is a surprising right like very surprising yeah they they don't just like bump up against it they like go into it a little bit there's some feelings here there's some social taboos there's some things that are people think are okay and not okay it's basically considered infidelity socially from a conservative perspective to bang a photon and way to where the way paris bridges this to tuvok is to say well if it's a photonic version of your wife and you literally have to fuck to save your life. That's probably something she would understand. Especially you are Vulcans. When the, especially when the alternative is you go psychotic and victimize someone in the crew. Not, and I get that or you're die. the world. Like, yeah, I get you're the world's worth security guy, and maybe you don't Addition understand through the subtraction. St- yeah, okay. <laughs> you don't understand the scope of what I'm saying. I mean, uh, what was it? four episodes no not even four episodes three episodes ago you just hijacked the whole fucking crew and forced yourself on like 12 maquis people and reactivated them and there was a mutiny and all this other stuff because you because you for forces outside of your control could not keep your hands to yourself remember that whole plot oh yeah two box bad touch well we don't need two box bad touch part two uh go take the holographic q-tip 
put it in there, kitty cat, and 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 get your head on straight. Tom is very catty during the he's he's enjoying seeing Tuvok in pain. He's enjoying kind of lording his position over him. And Tuvok's sitting there like praying, looking at his uh his Aladdin lamp, right? Sweating. A lot of sweat. Tuvok's a sweater. He does not have his Sang Soon uh robe on yet. He wears no. that to go fuck with. Yeah. But yeah, he's that's like, a, that's the that's a fucking robe. When Tom's like, yeah, maybe we're gonna do this. I'm like, you're you're basically like holding meat in front of a dog that's hungry. Like, you better hope he doesn't pawn far you, Tom. Like, now's not the time to act act smug. I think in pawn far a hole's a hole, so just watch it, bro. I could just like it's like the movie Roadhouse. I could just see Tuvok grabbing him by the shoulders and say, I used to fuck guys like you in prison. Yeah, that was a real awkward i watched that not too long ago and i was like wait hold on what i just see is this some fucking is this an unrated cut what, what's going on oh no place? that was a line in the in the theatrical cut wow oh yeah that was definitely spicy for its time spicy for now so i here's my pitch for what we need to label this um this episode medicinal real doll it's two different stories that's basically the same thing and that's that's what i that's the uh, i I don't even know how to that's the silly uh self-contradicting part of this episode you've got the a plot where the doctor goes into the walking barbie doll seven of nine to save his life right she's right. his medicinal real doll he has uploaded he is using this th- th- these implants in her to house himself uh to save his life and in the process to be able to interact with the crew of the uh bolivians or whatever we said they were belarusians <laughs> the belarusians uh and he is able to save lives as a ai riding a real doll doing real medicine and all that and the whole thrust of that is people are like hey um, you know, we've got this holographic war and it sounds like we were really attached to our, our, our holograms and life was great. And then they revolted and it's been what sounds like very ugly. And he goes, you know, they, they start laying down kind of like tinges. Maybe it was Westworldy, which we went in deep on, um, the Fairhaven part two, you know, talking about like, how can you really express that type of story? You can't do with the Federation. Um, but he's like, you know, listen, not all holograms are bad. Maybe you were mistreating them. Holograms are people, pro-holographic life. Like Taryn, I think, would really enjoy the speech the doctor gives there about holographic pro-life, right? Yep. Don't just, we're not, we're not just throw away fucked up. Meanwhile, on Voyager, <laughs> you've got the medicinal real doll there where literally Tom just whips up a new hologram for tuvok to go drag off to to high voltage pound town so <laughs> very opposite very uh, very very different stories granted very different stories that directly interact with each other uh to to very strong levels of contradiction but don't interact with each other too like the the b plot is only impacted insofar as the adventures that voyager gets up to to try and find Harry and Seven and the Doctor result in them not being able to use their holodecks, which literally gives Tuvok blue balls. I well, like I mean, I like Tuvok being punished, so if it's blue balls, so be it. But I thought that was pretty cool that again, jumping back into Blood Fever, Vork's got this problem, and even back in Blood Fever, we're like, why can't he just go fuck someone on the holodeck, right? Right. There's a very easy accessible solution which is of course always a problem in voyager when you can just replicate this replicate that as i recall in blood fever vork did in fact be was in fact given a hologram that the doctor created for him and he like murdered it or something he did something really fucked up i gosh you might be right yeah like they tried to use this with him and then he like murdered it and then went to go down to like sexually assault Bolana, whether anyone liked it or not and the plot was resolved because tom would not fuck Bolana, so she used all of her pent-up blue ball energy to beat the shit out of vorik and this like solved the problem 
Because that was what gave Vorik the super rape vibes, was that he, like, murdered this thing instead of using it for its intended purpose. Oh, Lisa Kink. You so kinky. Yeah, it was it was definitely a dark turn. <laughs> it's what led us down this road of like, this is horrific. Like, what do you do? In this case, they they decided the Tuvok's enough of a learned man that he can he can bury he's bury his D in some some holographic V and that it's gonna do it. Yeah. His mind's eye is much stronger than uh Vork. I completely forgot about Vork murdering that hologram. But what I was gonna say was like I like that they do the reasonable thing, which is, hey, go hump a hologram and get it done. And then the A plot is able to swoop in long enough to like shut that down. Right. Yeah. And create the next hurdle. And I was like, oh, that's good. I like that. (laughs) That works well. Speaking of the A plot. So what we break into is essentially a romantic comedy rom like sitcom plot. It is the doctor's never eaten food. So when he is being interrogated in Seven's body by the captain of the Belarusians, and he, Vaughn. he he re- gets a piece of cheesecake, which is obviously a piece of actual cheesecake that they got. It wasn't like that shitty fake food that, you know, was was the apple pie from two episodes ago or last episode, actually. Uh, it said this is an actual nice, fluffy piece of New York cheesecake. She, she you know, he eats it and he's like, holy shit, this is delicious. Hold on, I'll get you one slice. I'm going to keep eating this. So like, and so eats a bunch of food. Two uh, things happen in that scene. Drink, drinks a bunch of wine, gets drunk. First thing that happens there is I'm like, damn, I want that cheesecake. Yes, it looked delicious. That cheesecake looks fucking dope. The stuff thing that happened with me when he's replicating the second piece of cheesecake is uh, old me, season two me, comes back and I said, uh, excuse me, what about those replicator rations? Because she goes on to replicate, like, two of everything. Like, you've seen the meme of, like, uh, Wesley Crusher ordering all of the tacos and (laughs) causing the EPS power conduit to fail or whatever. That's what happens here. Because, uh, as you point out, you know, there's some wine and there is just a trail of dirty dishes. Which I'm like, oh, okay, it's going to start turning into like piles of clothing. Right? Did, did the doctor just bang this Belarusian in Seven's body? Uh, but no, it's just them laying there drunk. And then the doctor very insensitively bragging about all of the people that he has assimilated while he is trying to stay in character as Seven. While well, drunk. <laughs> yeah. And then he manipulates the Belarusian captain into giving the uh, mobile emitter up by saying it's like part of her like regeneration or whatever. Blah blah blah. It doesn't matter. It, they actually do call out the concept that he that she she fucked him for, or that he fucked the god. Okay, it's hard to keep the pronouns straight here. So it would have been he fucked the Belarusian captain in her body for it. It's an actual accusation that Harry Kim makes, which he has to refute saying he didn't do anything unladylike to get it. (laughs) So (laughs) they drag him back to the cell, right? And we've got classic Star Trek here where they roll out the uh, jump to assumptions mat and they assume that, hey, these fascist alien captors don't have any sort of monitoring, listening, spy devices in the jail cell. They wouldn't have cameras in their jail cells. That would be rude. (laughs) I would they violate our privacy. They wouldn't watch us pee with the remote camera. That aliens aren't pervy. Um, so she, uh, yeah, she she gets the mobile emitter. She puts the doctor back in there. The doctor pops out, and then we get real seven, who is not happy. And this ties right into what you said. And I was like, uh oh, is this going to turn into seven's making accusation uncomfortable? <laughs> No, episode. it's just seven. It's seven pissed that she's got to work all those calories off. <laughs> like that's that thing. Because I was about to be like, man, is this is going to be like you abuse my body and like I feel vi-, and it's not. She veers away from like the, the violation angle and turns into like 
Yeah. Do you know how long I'm going to have to starve myself? Like, do you know how hard it is to stay in this fucking cat suit, you asshole? <laughs> how much cheesecake you ate and how little forgiveness there is in this spandex? How dare you? <laughs> and even though, yeah, like, well, she starts saying basically that. And it's really, I think, Jerry Ryan also talking. In that moment, I feel for, like, God, I'm such a fat slob, and I love eating so much, and if my job required me to wear that fucking Band-Aid, she has to wear, like, I, I couldn't do it. I guess you could for enough money, right? Anyone can be motivated. <laughs> like, but yeah, it is, it is definitely a very unfair thing where that you put this on someone to say, you can't gain five pounds. Like, she can't. She just physically cannot. It would just be very unflattering given what she is forced to wear. Everybody else has that capacity a little bit. Too not bad. her. Kim. Um, <laughs> which... Not not, not to Bolana though. Roxanne Dawson, you know, just never gave up all those push-ups she stole. She's on a mission. This is another goofy direction the episode takes. Because at this point, they've got the hollow in her back. The doctor's program has been completely uh, dumped into this thing. She can turn it off. She said, hey, I need this for my regeneration cycles. And this is why you've given it. That, that's the con, right? It was like, right. I need that 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 sticky pad back because I'm a Borg. She doesn't say I'm a Borg, which, which is another thing. This fucking alien race, the, the Belarusians, hate holograms. But very obviously Borg lady. That's cool. No problem. To the point we're giving her technology back so her fucking implants don't rot off or whatever. Um, I, I also think that this episode's missing a component where the doctor's program is so big that its presence in her is like poisoning her or causing like serious discomfort. Like it's it's a total safe play. And again, I think due to the scope and complexity, that's silly. But no, instead of just keeping the doctor in the mobile emitter and it just being the Harry and Seven show, uh, they keep up this body swap gag. Uh, your other moment or required suspension of disbelief here is that Seven, who has kicked the shit out of the Voyager crew single handedly on multiple occasions. Yes, with and without the phaser rifle that she keeps in her cargo bay. Uh, does not just go ape shit on these fools it's their technological incompetence is fleshed out more solidly when voyager is stopped by one of their ships it is not a match for them and janeway basically says out of pity i will follow your rules or i'll kill you <laughs> like these are your options is i you escort us i won't turn on my holodex because i'm who fucking cares and uh, then I'll leave your space and you can deal with your Terminators if you want, whatever. What a novel problem. Or I will murder everyone on your ship. Which I feel is very out of character for her. Like, we've seen her get shitty before, but, like, just flat out threatening to blow another shit up. up. Like, she doesn't even threaten the Borg like that. Which, I, I I think it's appropriate because they did like just shoot out of her at her out of nowhere, so she's kind of annoyed. So she's just like, yeah, but she's you, also in their you, space, and again, flashing up the like, hey, we never told anybody don't have holograms on here. Like that's pretty fucked up, but like that's on the Belarusians. They failed to do that. I mean, this is classic shitty Janeway inconsistent writing. Where this time she. I, I'm I'm so tired of having this fucking discussion about like it 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 really is a crime how bad they portray this character. I mean that was something we talked about way back in episode one. I brought it up was Janeway's biggest black mark is that she is never consistently portrayed the same way. That at her best she's a great captain. And then at other times, they don't know how to make the plot work while keeping her competent. And so they have to force incompetence on her to make the plot happen. And it happens sane, so Sane, let alone competent. Like, yeah. if this was something coming out of Kirk's mouth, Cisco, uh, I, I, there would be no discussion. Sure, that's well within their character. Like, this person has an iron fist and they are willing to 
flex, but Janeway goes from being like this crazy pacifist to being the speech she just gave here may as well been what the hologram says in living witness when they're portraying the warship voyager that when diplomacy fails violence is the solution right like that's how crazy this fucking scene is to me uh but they're like okay well i'm gonna go and swallow my pride sure just turn your holodeck off and we'll roll with you please don't blow us up (laughs) warship voyager also uh i'm definitely writing about this in the next door app so more, been more one star reviews uh voyager came into my territory uh with our hated um holographic murder enemies and then threatened to murder me and then the cleveland bromar are like dude let me tell you what this fucking borg that rampaged did in our i just want to tie into this real quick too uh they talked about in the last episode oh uh, no no it was uh peace of mind right like hey uh i can't take all of your implants out you know we can do little stuff uh uh a thingy dad here a sub- assimilation tubules there which made me think that they did like declaw her and take her assimilation tubules out which clearly they didn't and i want to go ahead and call to question the sanity in leaving assimilation tubules in the drone who has gone rogue six or seven times and rampaged your ship like not not really good decisions being made with what seven and nine gets to keep and what she loses i have to say if i had a list of things that i would not allow seven of nine to keep under any circumstances any board options one through 27 would be their assimilation tubules (laughs) <laughs> like you know that thing that you jam into someone's neck and turn them into a borg and that you might be like forced to use at some point because of the million reasons why your body would be hijacked yeah let's just uh let's get rid of those let's just get listen rid of those. captain what if we're on an away team mission and someone drops their car keys down a storm sewer she could use her assimilation tubules to go down there and grab the keys. And then Janeway's like, that's a great point. Let her keep them. Why wouldn't we want tentacles? So if someone out if someone out there in the trauma support group wants to rationalize, why the fuck? Jack, it's up to you. The rom-com continues. The captain's horny for seven. The doctor is oblivious to the, the fact that the captain is horny for seven because he is not thinking in that frame. Because he's too busy uh, thirsting after the security slash medic. Correct. He is horny for the security guard slash medic. In fact, gets aroused in Seven's body when he's getting a massage to Seven's consternation. The captain makes a move on but the, on the doctor security has... has it for the doctor. I mean, you've got the love triangle here. You're going rom com. We're going full rom com. Oh yeah. There's a there's a a kiss. Someone gets thrown into some some panels, and eventually they come to the you know to the solution, which is the doctor is going to have to honeypot the Belarusian captain on the Delta flyer, and use that as a way to get a message to Voyager to let Voyager know where they are, and they do that, and of course they have the seduction scene. This is the doctor, so he undoes the hair. Let's the blonde locks flow and enhances the moment starts to waltz with him, but clearly doesn't know actually how to flirt with him. And and then eventually just, you know, does what he is good at, which is Colonel Campbell jamming a hypo spray in the neck with a sedative. The last time we saw this being critical care when he gave someone AIDS intentionally. Yeah. He's just super good at this, right? He's very good at neck, neck jabbing people. So he just, eventually relies on the old skills and then says sends the message to voyager to say hey i'm actually the doctor long story come get us what if joe one of the two times seven kicks the captain's ass right Mm -hmm. what if you just fully knocked him out and then took off the mobile emitter and put the doctor in there and had the doctor look like the captain and say let them go (laughs) <laughs> like they did in, in live fast and prosper you mean like exactly what if that the two people the most capable of kicking all the asses 
uh, beat the captain up, put in the, the mobile doctor emitter, and then just kicked everybody else's ass and say, I just already started by kicking the captain's ass and just took the ship over, flew away and said, hey, sorry, yeah. we didn't kill anybody. Leave us alone, please. You just, but no. Instead, you like, hey, meet me here in the in the Delta Flyer, and you get the doctor out, and the guy comes in, and the doctor just goes slappers only, headshot. Sure. Just puts, gives him an aneurysm, puts him out, and then the doctor just goes full like, oh, I access their database about what these holographic insurgents have been doing, and he just grows bladed arms, and he just rampages through the ship. You don't, you don't even need to do that, man. Just grab the phaser off the fl- I, I, They're trying. Hmm. Like they Ramrod. wanted, to, they Ramrod. wanted, they want to do the rom com plot, Peter. Let them do it. It's okay, man. Like I don't know how else to say this. I don't know. How else to, look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Okay, listen. Sometimes it's okay to just do the goofy thing. All right. It's funny. It's fun. It's breezy. It makes her a fun watch. It's okay. It's okay. They can do those if they cover their bases. And I feel like uh, Inside Man was a great example of you're doing a strong comedy theme and making it work and every all the pieces fit. And then you have a situation like this where you can just punch so many holes. Like again, I enjoyed the I enjoyed the majority of this episode. I think that some of the the hammy doctor portrayal stuff went on a little too long and I wasn't feeling that, but like there's there's right ways to do this stuff and then there's silly ways to do it. They're certainly opting for silly. And then another problem is, you know, they've thrown off the scale of what's possible when it's Riker and Worf and, you know, Worf's a little stronger and could throw a good punch and he can get electrocuted a lot without dying. And Riker's good at swinging his leg over a chair and, and crushing strange, right? They've got a skill set, but it's limited in scope. You've got basically superheroes at this point, right? Seven of nine is arguably a superhero. Uh, The doctor with this mobile emitter is certainly a superhero metahuman in in terms of capabilities. And when you start confining him to these, these zany plots and they're capable of so much more, like at one point does, does seven get taken by the arm? I want to say she does. (laughs) Immobilized by being grabbed in the arm. I'm sure it happens. Because finally, Actually, maybe I'll have to get a screenshot off because they finally do get into like the showdown on the bridge, right? Seven gets the message out, brings the doctor to sick, brings the Belarusian captain to sick bay. It's like, I don't know what happened to him. And he just gets revived. And he's like, she drugged me. (laughs) And so I take that back. She does get taken by the arm in sick bay. I'm going to get a screenshot. This is going up. They bring her to the bridge of like, I want to keep my eye on her because Voyager's coming. Uh, Voyager immediately runs hot dick all over them, so they like t- make their shields into a suicide switch to prevent them from attacking them, so they would kill the people that they came to get. These are people who don't give I, respect. <laughs> it's a baller move. The Belarusian, that's that's ballsy. And then Seven is permitted to slowly get out the the holographic emitter and tubulil it so that the Doctor appears, and then they have a low power physical conflict on the bridge while seven of nine disables their shields. Eventually the Voyager overwhelms them, but the Belarusian captain gets hurt and the doctor stays on board to treat him. So they doesn't die. This is, you know, you have a little come together Jesus moment. They all beam back over the Commander Tuvok gives uh, Paris's uh, fuck bot four out of five stars, and then Seven of Nine comes out with like a fog fogwa and have some wine, and and it's like I'll, I'm gonna indulge and I'll tell you about it, and that's their friendship moment. So that's how the episode actually ends. I think the divide you and I are having on this is I am very willing to allow this episode to do what it wants to do and enjoy it for what it is, which is. They wanted to do the comedy beat of Seven of Nine is the Doctor and have Jerry Ryan be Robert Picardo. And that part is good enough that I don't care that the rest of it doesn't make strict sense. Because when the show's not taking itself seriously, I feel like it gets that permission. 
when the show's trying to tell a serious or semi-serious story where it's like trying to deliver like all the stuff of the Borg and everything like that, it's different, right? Like you're trying to get me to be invested in this world in a way where these details matter. And therefore I'm going to hold you to account when these details suddenly don't make sense or don't matter for episodes like this. This is 26 episodes a season. We got to have some fun, little, some light stuff. Uh, let's do, let's do this thing. Let's have our two best actors basically swap roles and uh, it'll be fun. And they did that, and it is fun, and I'm fine with that. So you're saying, and I'm not, I'm not saying this to be, you know, shitty. I'm just that's okay if you are, though. I, I've known fair, you long enough. What what you're saying is a, is a fair is a fair concession. You're saying you have two sets of standards for Trek, and one set of standards is real sci-fi, um, serious, and then when the show says, "All right, we're flipping on the silly switch." Now we bring in the second set of standards and you are able to let that go. as like a guilty indulgence. Correct. Yeah, it's, that's a fair way of putting it. And I think viewed that way, you know, you jump into rascals and some of the, the sillier moments in Next Gen and other stuff. Like, it's fair. Maybe even there has to be three sets of standards. There's There's normal operating procedures, there's the silly moments, and then there's anything that involves Q because that's so wildly outside the scope of either of it and it's its own fucking thing um and it's interesting to think about trek in those terms i liked paris as a hollow pimp i wanted to know a lot more about the hologram war the conversations that the doctor has with the various crew members because they're all reasonable good people like you don't get evil nazi totalitarian they do not have any collars on their uniforms there's no standing collars anywhere near these Right. These are these are some very Galaxy Quest looking uniforms too. I'm I'm looking at it here. <laughs> I gotta it, get a picture. It is this. comically bad. Uh, um but they all seem good. They've been out in space a very long time. I kinda got some um what were the dudes from the year of hell? What were they called? Oh, uh fuck. Yeah, the time Krell Bodikers. Pulse. The time Bodikers. Uh, fuck. Kremen. Kremen. They were, they've been doing this a long time. They're tired. They miss their families. That's all the same vibes you get off of these guys. Um, there's a lot of sympathy. She's talking about growing up. Uh, they had a live in hologram that was very kind to her and, you know, encouraged her scientific pursuits and how much it hurt when that joined the, uh, the insurrection. Um, I would have loved it to see more, to hear more, to see some cool holographic kills. Um, Voyager, Janeway specifically acting crazy, talking about blowing people up. I like when, uh, so they got the escort, they catch the emergency distress signal from, um, uh, from Kim or uh, seven to nine, when they finally kind of hijack the ship and they call for help and she's like okay uh we gotta go so just sucker punch our transport and like take him out <laughs> not a very federation thing to do but she like just fires on them unprovoked blows their engines out before warping over to uh to, to get in this standoff with the other crew uh and again i i really like at the end the encapsulation of this of the doctor saying holograms are people and Give us a chance and this and that. And then the Tom Tuvok plot being like, fuck dolls. <laughs> Medicinal real dolls. All right. I think we've talked this one to death. I think we've covered it. I think this it's, is for being a silly episode. There's so much good stuff to talk about, though. Yeah, there was like the 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 deep canon that this episode decided to go into on Federation policy regarding the, the the holodecks being for fucking maybe it's most enduring quality uh but your enjoyment will vary and it all depends on if you're in the camp like myself where you're willing to create two separate kinds of standards for your entertainment even star trek where you kind of let them be silly when they want to be silly or if you're like peter and you just you just live a life of such literal uh you know kind of interpretation of things that you can't have joy so you know choose who you want to be do you want to have fun or be a charmless turd bucket i don't know 
keep talking like that. I'm going to come over there and grab you by the arm. <laughs> what do we watch next week? Like? Uh, let's see. Next week. Speaking of turd buckets, there's uh, Harry Kim sitting on a chair. Oh, Nightingale. no. Oh, oh no. Oh. Oh, going to the aid of a medical transport, Harry Kim gets his first command. Season seven, we're doing the story, huh? I mean, if you're not going to do it now, I guess you're never going to, right? That's fine by me. <laughs> never doing it. Didn't he already get his first command when he... Um, when he broke the, the prime directive, temporal prime directive, and like had Voyager cruise through L.A.? Or... Oh, well, there's also that. That was, was his first command. Where, I was thinking of the one where he brings the uh, AI warhead on the ship and victimizes Bolana Torres with it. Can't can't wait. Harry Kim can't win. All right, guys, thanks for listening to Vija Please, a hateful voice of the Delta Quadrant. Review us, share us, let Peter know he should live a little. Talk to you later. I uh I don't have a rule of acquisition. I've been trying to find out how to fit the last couple rules of acquisitions in before we wrap. I don't have one for this one, but I, I will go ahead and say just uh, remember, kids in the United Federation of Planets, the holodeck doesn't count.